What's up, everybody? If you're new, I'm Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Our special guest, you probably best know as the frontman of Motley Crue, John Karabi. Thank you so much for joining us here today to have this conversation. How are you? I am awesome. How are you doing in all this craziness? I'm good, man. I'm, I'm in uh, Nashville, uh, again, doing my little Big Lebowski imitation and uh, hanging out, trying to keep warm and working on new music. So if you're um, trying to keep warm, you should come here to Arizona, where it's legitimately always sunny and toasty. I've been there a few times, and uh, you know, uh, I, I've 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 had <laughs> quite a few good memories in in Arizona. Funny, some odd, some not so funny, but um, I I like it there. It can cool. definitely be an odd place. I can say the same. I've had some pretty interesting yeah. memories in my time here, but. Um, as we were saying, there is some crazy stuff going on. And I'm curious on your take of how you think right now all of this media insanity and the social media and the politics, how do you think that's affecting our mental health right now? I, you know, it's, well, obviously look at some of the stuff that's been happening, you know, just everywhere, you know what I mean? And state capitals and, and, and just, just in general, you know, uh, it's, it's, I, I don't, I, I can't, you know, I know people are frustrated and, and angry about a lot of different things. And I think now with this COVID thing, it's, it's kind of compounded a lot of just everyday things and just made them seem so much worse, you know, and there's a lot of uncertainty right now with, um, you know, people wondering if they're going to be able to pay their bills or if they're going to be able to eat or if they're going to lose the house that they've, you know, worked their whole lives for. And, you know, so people are really on edge, um, you know, but the bad thing I think is everybody's sitting home and they're watching the news 24 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless of what station you watch, you're getting a one-sided, the uh, one-sided feed, if you will. And, and then they're sitting on these things and, you know, on Facebook and Instagram and Parler and Twitter and, you know, and, and they're just being bombarded with, you know, just shit. And it's, and it's just, it's just sitting in there just stewing and um, it's just weird, man. I'm just, I just literally daily just shake my head at some of the shit Same. that I'm watching yeah. and seeing, not even, not even on the news, just in general. And it's like, are, are you fucking kidding me right now? It's, it, it's, it's really kind of scary. Do you know what I mean? It's weird. And I think that's what they want it to be. They want it to be scary. That's the media's job. That's the news's job. And people have forgotten that these days, that if they don't get you riled up, if they don't make you feel afraid or angry, then they're not doing their job and you're not going to tune in next time. We tune in because it triggers this very intense emotion and gives us kind of that dopamine hit, you know? Well, I agree it, though. The first thing yeah. I always tell anybody that's experiencing any symptoms of anxiety and depression, I say, get the hell off social media, stop watching the news. That's a good place to start right there. Just you can stay informed. You can you can definitely stay informed, but that does not mean having to watch the news twenty four seven. Yeah, and it's and it, you know, and and as a side note too, there's I'm I'm a bit older than probably most of your viewers, <laughs> but I you know it, it's it's weird. It's it's funny to me how um, politically segmented all these news outlets have become, you know, like, yeah. you know, Fox news obviously is very conservative. CNN is a complete opposite. MSNBC is, is somewhere in the middle. Uh, then, you, you know, just all these different, uh, you know, and I grew up, I grew up, you know, in the sixties when newscasters, didn't really have an opinion. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they reported the news as it was. The news as it was. Um, you know, Walter Cronkite and all this other kind of stuff. And it and it's weird. Like, I, I highly recommend everybody watching. And you and I already kind of discussed this. I I told you about it. But there's a there's a 
program on Netflix right now called The Social Dilemma. And um, it really kind of explains a lot of the shit that we're seeing right now and a lot of the discord that we're seeing with people. And it really kind of, it really kind of, um, you, you know, it was funny, like prior to seeing this, I would see things on Facebook or Instagram or on my computer, like whatever, I'd get news feeds and I would see articles and I would get angry. Like what, the, you know? And then I watched the, that social dilemma documentary and now I don't get so angry. Now I just, I'm like, whatever, you know, just don't even respond. Don't even think about it. Move it to the side because, you know, nine times out of 10, it's just bullshit. Um, but it's really weird, like how um, this, this whole system now grew out of, you know, the, I mean, I guess the, like the whole, all of these social media things like Google and yeah, and it's just all of these search engines started out as cool informational tools. Like, oh, um, I want some information on the prime minister of England and you can Google them and there's, there's information there. But as an artist now, I've kind of realized like my Wikipedia page you can go in and hit edit and put in yep. whatever you want. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And it's weird. So it's bullshit. My birthday's wrong on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So maybe it's sending him birthday wishes. Don't go to Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't send them. Just I know send you're in cash. April, right? Because I know. Just send cash. <laughs> <laughs> We're um, in the same month, though. You are in April. I do remember that. April 26th. 26th. Yes. Doesn't Wikipedia say 29th, I believe? No, it says the 10th. Oh, we, very weird. Yeah, very but it's, weird. it's you know, it, well, it did anyway. I, I, I think I told somebody to go in and correct it, but you know, it's, it's just funny to me, like everything can be edited. Now the whole, whole thing, like, I, I think it's awesome that I can take my phone, I can be anywhere in the world and I can type in a restaurant or an address if I'm yes. on tour. Super helpful. And I can walk outside of my hotel and I can just go, oh, it's two blocks to the left and I can walk and I can sit down and have a nice dinner. That's great. But the, the thing of it is now, like these guys that, that were the programmers and developers of all of these systems have now figured out that, I know this is kind of weird. It's almost kind of like ter very Terminator, you know, whatever, but they've all figured out that these machines uh, have have somehow uh, developed profiles for every person around the world that uses Facebook, Instagram, Google, like all this shit. And and the minute you type in um, new, like you know, you go to say Google and you type in uh, twenty twenty one Forest River. Berkshire XLT 45A motorhome. That was they, very oddly specific. Well, <laughs> I think you typed that in a few times. I, I, I actually own one, but, um, but you type it in and it's like, when I was first looking for my motorhome, I, it was like, I typed it in and then I just started getting inundated with all different motorhome companies. So they kind of figured that it would, like all of these search engines, they could make financial gain. It was all about financial gain. How do we use this information and monetize it? But the problem of it is now is every time you type something into your computer or I type something into my phone or computer, it profiles the things that you looked up and the things that I looked up and then it just inundates you with stuff the stuff you. that is in, you know what I mean? And I think the bigger problem with that, other than the financial aspect of it, it's okay, I can kind of get over the concept of them giving you relevant ads for the things that you were searching for as far as things to buy, right? But the thing that bothers me is say, I search Biden crazy dementia or Trump 
jerk something, you know, if I search something that's politically related, related now, I'm going to start getting all sorts of ads and get un inundated with that all of the time, which is just further shoving all that in my brain. Like you were saying before, now you're constantly, if you look at your computer, if you look at your phone for two seconds, you're just going to be flooded with all of these and that's, things. That's, that's what they say in, in the documentary. What happened is, is now you have, you have like, um, for example, let's keep both of those parties out of it and just say like these, the QAnon people um, are very conspiracy theory minded people, you know what I mean? And so they look up, you know, the Kennedy assassination it wasn't Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald, you know, it was Ted Cruz's dad, you know, and, you know, and they, and they look this shit up and the computer recognizes that and it sets, it, and it just sends them all conspiracy theory yep. shit. Yep. And that's what the guy says in the, in the documentary. And this is one of the guys that developed, I don't know, Instagram or Google or one of them. It was all the guys that developed all of these different programs have now bonded together to sort make another thing about, they made another organization that is trying to alert people about the disinformation that's out there. And, but the, the, the thing that got me the most was that the guy said the computers inadvertently have created a world where every person in the world is never wrong. Yeah. So whatever you believe, everything that's being fed to you is in, in lockstep with what you're already Absolutely. thinking. Yep. So you're never going to be wrong. And I think a lot of this shit is like, you know, you've got total liberals that are just getting nothing but liberal feeds. You've got conservatives that are getting nothing but conservative feeds. And you've got QAnon people who are getting nothing but QAnon or conspiracy theory feeds. And it's like, I mean, even look at it now, like even the Republican Party right now, I think is two, two separate parties just like the democratic party is two separate parties there's the people that are kind of on on uh moderate and then there's the other people way out there that just want to almost socialism do you know what i mean um so it's everything is starting to divide into groups and these groups are just warring with each other people in the republican party are warring with each other and the QAnon people and the socialism, the more socialist viewpoint people are arguing with the mainstreams. Do you know what I mean? And then, and then they're all arguing with each other. And it's like, fuck, it's just getting worse. And it's going to get worse until somebody says, stop. Uh, and we really do something to stop it. I mean, everybody right now is posting, we have to stop the fake news. We have to stop censoring or we need to censor more depending on what side you're on. By the way, guys, I'm going to link all this below so you can check it out for yourself and make what you will of these different documentaries and stuff. But I do think it's interesting that it's from the source. You know, it's not somebody Googled some conspiracy theories and made a documentary about it. It's from the source. And at the end of the day, it's not a secret that they're utilizing our information to kind of give us a profile, you know, of what they advertise. That's not a secret. We all know that. We all have kind of come to understand and accept that. I can kind of give a little insight. It was very interesting. A few years ago, I was kind of the PR person for a, a pretty well-known uh, conservative figure, public figure. And for a while, I was looking up things related to her or her campaign or her cause or her charity or whatever. And during that time, all I got all over my social media, because I wasn't doing a lot for myself at the time, I wasn't uh, promoting my own stuff. All I got was all of these ads for things related to her, her cause, her belief, her, her um, persona. Yeah. And when I started shifting back to doing my own stuff, the, the theme of my whole entire social media shifted. I didn't change, I didn't add or remove friends. I didn't really do anything else. I had just been searching different things and been uh, researching different things or been responding in different ways because I responded to some of her mail and stuff. So I would respond, you know, to these people um, with more of a conservative tone. Mm -hmm. and all, yeah, my, the, the, the tone of everything 
for me online from my social media to my Google to the ads that popped up on the side of my email all drastically shifted within maybe a week. It was insane. Well, and, really and, and it's funny out. too, again, I don't want to keep referencing movies, but I highly recommend watching The Social Dilemma. I highly recommend watching from a political point of view is another documentary called The Swamp. And I highly recommend watching the movie Snowden um, because it, it, you know, again, I think technology is, can be awesome. Um, but I also think it can be very dangerous. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And it's just, it's just weird technology you know, how do you limit it? You, can you limit it? Is it, you know, are you infringing? But at the same time, um, you know, you have some groups that are like, well, we have to, we have to, in, we have to infringe on social media when it comes to uh, children being abducted, that's dangerous. So we can, there's, you know, there's a right there. Well, okay, so if you do that, which I totally agree with, you have to, you know, see what your children are doing and protect them. I don't know. It's, it, it's a slippery slope, but like, I'm, I'm fine. Like if someone yells fire in a crowded movie theater and 10 or 15 people are hurt or killed, then legally that person can be thrown in jail for inciting panic. panic, you know? And it's kind of the same thing. Like if you write something that is blatantly false on the internet, like somebody should be, I feel should be held accountable for their actions. I was just raised like, if you, if you get caught with your hand at, with your hand in a cookie jar when you know you're not supposed to be having a cookie before dinner you're gonna get your ass smacked like whatever so there's consequences to everything you know uh if you're in a relationship and you fuck around with somebody else there's gonna be consequences and you know and i just think that everybody's so focused on the uh infringement part of every aspect of our lives now it's it's just it, like the, the whole thing is it's a slippery slope i think we've lost the positive aspect that you were talking about of uh, electronics and media and being connected and everything i feel like people are kind of losing sight of that to get wrapped up in like you said this fear of being followed or watched or tracked, which I understand, you know, I, I, I have a lot of pretty heavy conversations with people through text or whatever that I don't want government agent Joe Schmo reading about, but at the same time, government agent Joe Schmo is not gonna take the time unless I'm sitting there typing, I'm going to go bomb the White House right now and I have a hit on President Trump. I mean, that probably just got me something on my phone. They're probably going to listen now, but I'm just saying that there's, there's no, there, there's, they're not watching the little people. I don't think that they're listening to every single little tiny, obviously they don't have time for that. And I feel like that's become a paranoia, but there is the aspect that we've just lost sight of the positive aspect of electronics and of being connected and of media. Instead of saying, hey, I could send my friend a really nice message today on Facebook, letting her know how much she means to me. We're going to choose to say, hey, I'm going to post this really controversial thing over on my social media, getting everybody riled up and angering everyone when there's really nothing that can be done. And that's my boundary. We've become, we've become, I feel we've become, and I'm, I'm kind of guilty of it too, to a degree but we've kind of become a, I call it the like generation. Everybody posts things and then they, an hour later, they check their post to see how many likes they got. Yes. People like me. Oh God, look at how many likes I got on that video or how many of the, do you know what I mean? And it's so, I, I don't know how this fits into the mental health thing. I think to a degree, we've all become a little bit fucking nuts, but 
it, you know, it, it is crazy. It, it, what's the word self, uh, self absorbed. So yeah, it's self absorbed self. It's self gratification. Like, Oh, I, you know, 4,000 people liked my comment today. Who cares? What's that going to do in the end? And I can tell you exactly actually how it fits into the mental health realm. There's two major things behind that is now you are putting your self-worth on whether or not you get YouTube subscribers or Facebook followers or Instagram likes. You are literally putting your worth on whether or not someone else clicks a button on your picture. Yeah. That's, that's the first big issue. Yeah. Right? And, and, and the funny thing of it is, is, you know, the two or 3000 or 4,000 likes that you have, if you were down in the dumps, not one of those likes is going to help you out of the situation that you're not. Mentally or financially or physically or nothing. So it's, it's, it's all moot. Do you know what I mean? It's weird to me. Like and the other major just, issue with that is it's perpetuating addiction because if you post a picture and I see this with my friends all the time, they'll post a picture and then five minutes later, they refresh to see if they got any likes. And then 10 minutes later, they refresh to see if they get, get any likes. The problem with that is every time you do that, you're getting the dopamine hit from seeing, oh, somebody liked my picture. Oh, somebody liked my picture. So you get that dopamine hit. Then when they start waning off and there's not as many likes because the picture is old now, you're going, oh, well, now, now nobody likes me. I have to, I have to post something else. And then the cycle starts over. So all you're doing is perpetuating the exact same cycle that you would be doing if you were hitting cocaine, if you were shooting up heroin, you're perpetuating that exact same dopamine cycle of pleasure. Yeah. So or, pleasurable. Or it's, cool. it's, 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 you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be, a, you know, it could be cocaine, it could be heroin, it could be a drink, it could be a donut, it could be, it could be plastic surgery. It could be whatever. It's like you, you're constantly cry. You're constantly moving forward and, 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 and just, uh, I need, I need more of the, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just crazy to me. And, and, and it's funny going back, like you, you, you said this earlier about the people that feel like, Oh, the government's, you know, watching, you know, it, it, it it's, it, I had a friend that was like, did not, did not want to have, uh, you know, uh, I don't want a credit card. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want to, I don't want the government to know what I'm, I'm buying and eating, but he's like, I don't want a credit card, but he had a debit card. <laughs> That's okay. funny. I don't want the government to have a record or know what I'm, know what I'm eating. There's not and really I, a difference I, there, my friend. Well, I sat there and I'm going to use this as an example, but I sat there, I go, okay, so you have a bank card and you're using that. You're taking cash out of ATMs. So they always know where you're at. Okay. And then you see this little thing right here, that little barcode. Yep. We've, we've had those forever. It's a barcode scan. Track. And it goes to wherever it goes. It's it's a record of, and so it's it's funny. Like it, I I just don't understand. Like sometimes I just sit there and I go, what, yeah. what the fuck? Sears. Like I I just want to sit there and go. Psh, psh. <laughs> <laughs> like okay, do you realize how dumb that sounds right now? Like you don't want a credit card. But you'll use it, you know what I mean? And short of you having like a million dollars stuffed in your mattress and being completely off the grid in a cabin in like Montana mountains, you're like, sorry. That sounds like a fantastic idea, actually. Let's just go there. (laughs) At least we wouldn't have social media. (laughs) We see where that ended up with Ted Kaczynski, whatever. So anywho, (laughs) the Unabomber. Yeah, yeah, I remember that whole situation. There's been so many tragic instances like that, and I don't see it, unfortunately, really improving anytime in the near future. If anything, I see it becoming worse because people are, are incited by all of the fear and all of the anger for change not happening. Well, wake up call people. Change is not going to happen from us burning down the very buildings of the people you say you're trying to help and supporting. That's not how we're going to make change. I in the biggest proponent of equality, equality for gays, transgenders, people of color, equality across the board, women, men, equality. 
this is not how we get it. This is not how we move forward. This is not how we make positive change. Yeah. And it's, and it's true because I didn't, you know, I, I, I know like quite a few of my friends were, you know, I was just in, in shock over what happened at the Capitol and they're like, well, you know, Hey, fuck, you know, it was, uh, you know, so like black lives matter Antifa, they were doing the same thing this summer. And I go, and that wasn't right either. You're literally going in and burning down someone else's livelihood yeah. to make your point. I, there has to be a better way. I there remember. Be a way. I remember. And, I think I told you about this. I had a bumper sticker once upon a time that says, "Fighting for peace is like fucking for virginity." It, there you go, and yes. you know, it, and it's just it's just sad to me, like. <clears throat> and, and again, I mentioned this in my book, everybody associates um, uh, discrimination or racism, they associate it with the South. I live in the South now, I live in Nashville. But it's funny, like, I remember clearly, as a kid growing up in Philadelphia, when I was a kid, Went, like we used to go to this public park around the corner from my house and it was it was called uh hunting park in 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 um philadelphia and they used to have fireworks displays in the summer and for fourth of july and all this other stuff but it was there was a public pool there and i remember being more than confused as a kid like in the summer, the public pool was open, but you could only go certain days. Like, you know, I think, I, I don't remember the days, but like the white kids could go on Monday, oh, wow. Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. And then the black kids would go on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And I, I remember asking my dad about it. You know what I mean? And it was like, um, you know, that's just how it is. You know, it's like, you don't like, you can't, you can't swim in the water with those other kids. And he wasn't being, he wasn't being racist at all. My dad was not at all. It was the it, times. It was just the times. Like he was explaining to me, like, well, that's just the rules. Like the black kids have to go on that day and the white kids can't go on this day because they don't want, you know, and it was just like, what the fuck? Like, that was in Philadelphia and you know now we have come really far, far. <clears throat> you know but I do have some I had a guitar player uh, a, you know a black guy that played with me for a while and, and you know he definitely got hassled in New York oh yeah not that long ago and um you know so I I get the anger you know, it's it's funny. There's a famous, not far from Nashville, maybe 20 minutes from here. There's a little town called Ashland City, and there's, you know, this old like 100, 120 year old tree there, and it was literally called the Hanging Tree, and that's where they used to hang, you know, slaves and black people and. And I'm just like, fuck, man, it's it's crazy to me that, you know, to some degree, we're still kind of fighting, you, you know, still fighting a lot of this shit. And, and, and it needs to be level. That's it. It definitely needs to be leveled. But again, like. Um, anger never helps anger um you especially know, when you're expressing it in that way it's okay to be angry and utilize that as passion to make change absolutely be angry be angry and go fight for change but burning down people's businesses and rioting and pillaging that's not helping anyone that's doing harm okay. to again, the people you're trying to help unfortunately if you look at the history it's not just america man if you look yeah. at the history of the world the british in africa um you know 
uh, against a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the proper term is. It's like, uh, um, you know, but how the British government went in and, and, and um, you know, uh, against a lot of the tribes and stuff in Africa, it got to the point where there was an uprising you know, if you yeah. look at if you look at the the way the Americans treated Native American Indians, do you know what I mean? It 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 came down to, you know, it came down to that, you know, violence. Little Bighorn, you know, uh, what's that place where the uh, American soldiers went in? It's um, God, I can't remember the name. It's Standing Knee or Wounded Knee. Um, where the Americans went in and just slaughtered like, you know, thousands of Native American men, women, and children. And, you know, and it's just crazy to me. Like, it's like, it's never, I mean, it changed the course of history, but was it a positive change? Right. Um, you know, like, you know, somebody at some point, I like in what we're doing now, and, but it's, it's, it's happened throughout history but I liken it to two people standing there disagreeing with each other and just not saying anything, just punch in the face, punch in the face, yeah. punch in the face, punch in the face. And at some point, you're just going to sit there and beat each other to a pulp until somebody goes, you know what, what are we doing? Hold on. Let's just wait. I got an idea. Let's talk about this. <laughs> Let, yeah. Let's truly talk about it sit down and figure it out and it, it's it's really sad but i think it's you know we're we're getting to another boiling point um one that i don't think we've seen since the civil war and yeah. i think we get to this boiling point because we don't have those conversations because it very much becomes an us versus them mentality see i grew up i i have native american blood not enough you know, to be considered legally Native American, whatever that means, but I do have Native American blood and my dad was uh, very passionate about that and very passionate about us learning about the Trail of Tears and things like that. So I grew up knowing that these issues were going on, these issues had gone on through history and I very much wanted to speak out about them. And I very much wanted to, you know, always make sure that everyone was equal and make sure that everybody's voice was heard. And that's actually part of the reason I started this channel is just because I wanted everyone in the mental health conversation, people of color, gays, you know, women, I just wanted everyone, regardless of where, what their background is, what they believe in. I just want everybody's story to be heard. And I feel like if we would just do that and listen to each other and hear each other's stories, we'd probably start finding some common ground and move forward. That's, but that's the thing. Like, I don't think people realize, like, people are too busy talking um, and when listening. you're talking, you're not listening. Right. Um, they're too busy arguing, you know, and, 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 and there, there's an argument for everything. Um, you know, and, and you have to have people that are open-minded enough to be able to sit down and speak, but also listen to the concerns of the person they're speaking to. Yeah, uh, that's just not something. And then, and then realize, <laughs> realize everybody says, oh, it's just black and white. No, I'm pretty sure that the world is made up. If you really looked at everything, and I don't give a shit whether you're a politician, um, whether you're in a band, whether you're in just a marriage, a relationship, there is a, there is fucking compromise in everything. So to me, I think the world is about like there's black and white, but there's a shit ton of gray in the middle, a shit ton of it. And until people can actually step into the gray area and go, okay, you know what? It's not that bad. It's really not that bad. And it, you know, it, it, it's funny to me. Um, I've written songs in the past. I, I wrote a song with the dead daisies. Um, oddly enough, called Rise Up. Not in the sense of the word of what we've just seen this week. That wasn't my intention. 
but it was funny when we released the record, it's been fuck two years now. Um, this guy wrote to me, it might've been a little longer to be honest with you. Now that I think about it, probably about three years, this guy wrote to me and he said, Hey, I really liked the song. I just, you wouldn't have been, um, I just wish you wouldn't have been so fucking political um, in, in tearing down our president. And, and he was referring to Trump. And I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not understanding your statement here. Um, so I went back, like I was t- going back and forth on this guy. He had, he had personally like emailed me or Googled me or not Googled, uh, Messenger. <clears throat> so I went back into my computer and I got the lyrics for Rise Up and I co- copied and pa- copied and pasted them into it, uh, a response. And I said, here's the lyrics. And I, I, I don't understand, like, in no way, shape or form, is there anything in here about any sort of disdain or whatever for Donald Trump? I'm just saying, like, we're so busy bickering with each other, we don't realize that those guys are in Washington are also bickering with each other to the point where we're now siding here. Like, when I say rise up, I just mean we need to stop fighting each other and hold everybody in Washington accountable for every, like, you know, whatever. If, you know, um, and stop buying into the bullshit. You know, I again watch the swamp because that'll explain a lot of things politically as well. Um, but it's just like, you know, s- just stop fighting, man. There's so much gray area. So I got into this thing and I did an interview with someone that mentioned that song. Um, and I said, you know, it's funny to me, like, I think if you took any real conservative person and put them in a room and you took any real liberal person and put them in the same room and had it just a neutral human being moderating a discussion i go you would probably find out that most people people just want the same things in life They want to be able to buy a house, work, take their family on, you know, on a vacation or two. Um, They just want to lead a normal life. They don't want to be overtaxed. They don't want to be undertaxed. They just want to find a happy little medium there. And they want to be able to afford things like health care. And they don't want to lose everything that they've worked for their whole life if at 55, they have a heart attack and they're in the hospital for a couple of weeks. They don't want to come home and find out that there's a, you know, couple hundred thousand dollar lien on their house because they couldn't afford to pay the bill. Um, You know what I mean? And I like taking all of the religious aspects out of politics and all like all the religious moral things out of politics, like, oh, gay marriage or abortion or things like that. And just ask two people from opposite spectrums, what do you want out of life? And I'm pretty sure they'll be on the same page. I, I really truly believe that. Um, you know, and I, I kind of see things for, I try to see things from all angles. I have some friends that are hardcore conservatives. And I'm not so much I, like I'm, I'm financially conservative. Like I, I don't feel like, you know, whatever, take, take care of your own. And then if you have extra and you want to give, give. I know everybody out there when they were kids, if they did something wrong, there was <clears throat> a consequence. And, you know, it's just like, you can't, you, you can't escape that. That's just good, good people. You know what I mean? That's, that's being a good person. Like get up today, 
I'm going to take a shower, brush my teeth, hygiene. I'm going to do that. Um, and I'm just going to go out and just be the best human I can today. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to treat my body like a temple, you know, whatever your temple is. Love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor. I'm not going to love her too much because if <laughs> she's married, whatever. I'm going to stay, you know, but just follow simple fucking guidelines. It's really not that fucking hard. I think it's hilarious because I'm a non-believer and I all the time get people asking me, well, how, how do you have values and morals? Like, what do you follow if you don't have a 10 commandments or whatever the case is, the, the agreements of Buddhism? Uh, people always wonder, well, how do you have morals? Be be because I'm, I'm a human that just instinctively knows that killing other people is wrong and that I shouldn't be stealing or lying. That's just, that was my upbringing outside of any kind of religious setting. You know, that wasn't, that didn't, that didn't come from a religious institution that came from my parents instilling me to be a good human being. Yeah. I mean, I, I was born and raised to be honest with you, like a Roman Catholic Italian, you know, family, but I don't really buy into the Catholic religion. Uh, I, it, it's just, and I could sit here for hours and give you a hundred examples, but, um, you know, I just feel like, um, there's a little adages that my parents said, you know, um, for example, like you can't help anybody else if you can't help yourself. I, I don't know why, but that makes sense to me. Like if I'm a shit show, how the fuck am I supposed to give somebody advice? If I'm, if I'm not able to feed my own family or I'm not able to financially take care of myself, how is it that I'm, I can, how, how am I supposed to give money to somebody else? Do you know what I mean? So it's like, there, you know, and it's just simple things, man. Like, and I think that we've, you know, we've become so obsessed with this bullshit and computers and, you know, some of the technology that we've kind of forgotten just the simple wonder years kind of living, you know what I mean? It's just like, like I said, get up in the morning, brush your teeth, take a shower, hygiene, you know, put on a nice suit or put on a nice pair of cl clean pair of clothes. You know, mom always used to say when, if you get into a car accident, you don't want a dirty pair of underwear, I remember you know, that. whatever. And it's just like, you go do your thing, work hard. That's what my dad told me. If you work hard, you'll get the things that you want. Work hard for them. And then, you know, don't worry about the other guy. Worry about yourself. You know, if the other guy falls, help him up, you know? And it's just, we, we've kind of gotten off on this fucking tangent. And we're, we're, we're like in our world, but we're looking over there too. We're going, well, hey, what's he doing over there? Like, why is he doing that? that that's wrong. That's not what I would do. Of course, it's not what you would do. That's it's what you. He, it's not you. You know what I mean? And it's it's just funny to me when I just sit there and I, I just see people like, you know, they criticize people for doing things in a different way. I get that a lot. I get yeah, criticized a lot just for choices. As I was saying, my son and I decided to go get manicures together because he wanted to paint his nails black, uh, like Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park. And there was a nail polish. It was black called Lincoln Park. So we went to a salon. I ended up getting death threats and hate mail because me and my kid went to a salon together. Yeah. Was that hurting anybody? Was that perpetuating some kind of terrible value into him <laughs> no it and and again it's you know and and same with me when i was i remember um it, it was a long time ago uh, my son was maybe four five years old he's 32 now so um i was on tour and obviously i'm very you know music 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 so the apple, that apple, my son didn't fall far from the tree. So he's always been very, uh, it, like MTV was always on watching videos, you know, 
back so when it was, was videos. Yeah, he was very aware of a lot of these bands that I was now hanging with and talking to. And he loved, um, he loved, I forget what one it was, but it was a Bullet Boys song that they were playing on the TV. I don't know if it was for the love of money or the other one, Smooth Up In Ya. Um, but he liked one of their videos. And I had, I had been on tour with them or, or I was getting ready to go on tour with them. I think I was getting ready to go on tour with them with the first band that I was in called The Scream. And they did a show, a surprise show at a place called The Troubadour in LA. And I, my wife and I were going to go. And my son was very young. He's like, I want to go, you know, whatever. He's having to come apart. He wanted to see the Bullet Boys. So I called the club and this woman, Gina, used to run uh, the club. So I said to Gina, I said, Gina, and she knew my son, like she had seen him since he was a baby. I said, Ian really wants to come and see the Bullet Boys. Is it cool for me to bring him to the club? And she was like, oh yeah, you know, whatever, just, you know, make sure he's got earphones or earplugs, it's gonna be loud. And I said, yeah, I know. And I went and I literally bought those headphones that you see the guys at the airports using. You know, I bought a little mini set. So, you know, I put them on him and I was literally holding him at the show. And we watched the whole thing. And then this guy came over to me at the end of the show and started freaking out you're a fucking, I can't believe you brought that fucking kid to a show. Meanwhile, he's dropping F-bombs. I was going to say, because that's good for the kid. <laughs> right? He's dropping F-bombs in front of the kid. And he's, you know, and he's, I can't believe you brought that fucking kid. And tearing apart show. your son's dad right in front of him. And I'm literally sitting there and I let him speak. And I was like, you know what, dude? And I took my son and I handed him to my wife at the time. And I, I said, you know what? Fuck off. It's my kid. I'm raising him. I'm paying for him. I'm doing every, I'm, you know, I'm doing the best I can. Fuck off. And I will bet you that your son probably still remembers that. Mine, his first day, he skipped the first day of first grade to go to a Simple Plan concert with me. And the opening band, well, uh, patent pending, the open, opening band was patent pending. And the lead singer comes over, looks at my kid, who I think was about six at the time, and says, have you ever been crowd surfing? Picks my child up and puts him in the crowd. <laughs> so if you're a bad parent, I probably am not going to get mom of the year anytime soon. <laughs> No, but it's just, you know. But he still talks about it and he turns 10 this month and still, remember that time when we went to, you know, he's, he's, he was very, very, it meant a lot to him. He was very touching. Yeah, you know, and it's like, they, you know, kids just want to hang with mom and dad and they just want to, you know, have fun. And, you know, so I was like, you know what, fuck it. You know, I'll, I'll, the, I mean, Bullet Boy started it, you know, 8 30 9 o'clock it was an early show i'm like fuck it whatever i'll put him to bed at 11 11 30 you know i took him to the show and he was so jazzed about it and and oddly enough now he plays drums for me and my solo band but he actually knows jimmy the drummer and mark and all the guys now so he's grown up from seeing them on stage to actually now being able to walk over to them and go, Hey, Jimmy, man, how you doing, buddy? And, you know, there, there's a relationship there and, you know, but uh, you know, it's just like, dude, seriously, why don't you just go somewhere else and finish your beer and finish your drink and mind your own fucking business at what I'm doing. I mean, if you were hitting your son, yeah, then somebody should intervene. If you're doing something terrible, intervene but when somebody is bringing their kid to a rock show and the kid's having fun is it really any of your business probably not yeah and it's again you know not you know not to be weird but i just think that everybody's so concerned with everybody else what everybody else is doing you know what just just deal with your own life just deal with your own situation and and 
and enjoy your life and and just you know again like there's been times where i've unintentionally fucked somebody over and i was the first person to get on the phone and go hey man i'm really sorry like i i I didn't, I didn't see that angle when I was doing what I was doing. I, I just, I didn't even think about it. I didn't see it. And I'm really, really sorry. How can I make this up to you? And I think like nobody cares about consequences anymore. They're Everybody like, please take notes that that is how you should act when you do or say something wrong. That is what exactly what you should say and do is I'm sorry, let me make it up to you. I'm sorry, let me make that right. While we're on the topic of your son, if you're okay with it, I want to talk a little bit about the darkness he fell into and how he kind of lost his way and you helped him out of that. Yeah, you know, it's funny, again, coming from somebody that's never really done like drugs. And when I said, you know, I tried shit, you know, like I'll still to this day, I'll smoke a little weed or whatever, you know, but I, and I've tried things, you know, when I was growing up a teenager, I tried, um, you know, acid and I tried, you know, uh, you know, quaaludes, but I had like, I personally had something really traumatic happen to me when I was younger. That kind of was like, uh, like there was a few drugs that I just, uh, I don't, I don't even want to try those. And it was heroin, cocaine, meth, you know, all the shit. And it was weird. So like, I totally got through all of the scream. I never did Coke. I never did meth. I never did any, any of that shit, heroin, whatever. And then I joined Motley and I still have fans to this day go, Okay, dude, seriously, you were in Motley Crue and you never did drugs. No, I didn't. Um, you know, so I got through all that shit and all the different bands and it was probably about five, six years ago. Maybe about, I, yeah, I guess it was, it's been a while now, five, six years ago. My son called me and we have a very odd relationship because he tells me everything um, and he usually calls me for me, uh, go figure, to point him in a direction and, you know, so I feel very grateful for the fact that he's at least honest with me all the time, brutally honest with me all the time. So I get this phone call and he said, Hey dad, you know, he was in LA. I was already here in Nashville. And he said, Hey dad, um, I want to talk to you about something. I know you're going to be mad at me, but I, I, I need to talk to you. So I said, okay. I lit a cigarette <laughs> and um, so he basically just said, Hey, I, I got a level with you. I'm kind of in a bind. Um, and I've been doing, I've been doing heroin for about a year. And I was like, what? And he explained to me how he thinks he gotten, I keep, I do this a lot. Sorry. So, I do it too. Yeah. Um, how he got involved in this and he had been in a car accident a few years prior. He was pre prescribed pain pills and one thing led to another. Then he met a girl and she was into like pain pills and she started with the heroin and he started with the heroin in the friends. And, and um, so I was like, what can I do to help? I don't know. You know, and he was just rambling and, you know, I was trying to make sense of a lot of shit. And, and then it was weird for God probably the better part of four, five, six months, 
um, he called me pretty much nightly and he was just upset, crying, and he was angry with himself. He's like, I don't know how I got in this fucking position. Uh, I can't believe I'm fucking doing this shit, you know? And, and he knew he was doing something that was not good. Do you know what I mean? But he couldn't get out of it. And, you know, and he was crying, he'd be crying on the phone and I would, you know, I'm here with my, uh, now my wife, my girlfriend at the time, I would go outside on the front step, light a cigarette and, and he was talking crazy. Like, I'm just going to kill myself and get it over with. And, you know, and then I would talk him off the ledge and then, you know, then, and then he would hang up and then I'd be sitting there like, but I'd call him back and he wouldn't answer. And I'm sitting there like a fucking basket case. That's every parent's nightmare right there. Yes. And, um, and then I would try and go back to sleep and, you know, whatever. So after about four, I, I don't remember how long it was, maybe four or five months, he called me and he said, um, can I come live with you and Debbie, my, my wife now? And I, and I, you know, in all honesty, I, I was like, um, I'm fine with it. This is something as an adult that I need to talk to my wife about. Um, I'll call you back. So I got off the phone and I went and, and I, I felt it was the right thing to do. Maybe I'm wrong, but being in a relationship. It was the respectful thing. Yeah. Was I was just trying to be respectful to my wife and just say, hey, I want to bring my heroin addicted son that's definitely a conversation that you have to have when you're together. Into a house here. Are you cool with this? And thankfully, she was like, absolutely, because I see how this is hand. You're handling this. You're a fucking basket case. Every time the phone rings, you literally spring off the couch like, uh, you know, what's going on? So I sent him a plane ticket and I he flew out to Nashville and I talked with a friend of mine um, who had dealt with this stuff in the past himself. And um, I asked him, I said, Hey dude, like, here's the deal. My kid is, you know, he's addicted. And, and so he, I don't know how he got him. I don't know if he talked to a doctor or what, but he handed me an envelope with one month supply of the stuff called Suboxone. And he told me that it's like a little piece of paper and you, you got to cut like there, there's like four bars on a piece of paper. And he said, um, you know, you take the Suboxone, give him one bar and then hide them because it's also can be addictive, but this will help. It's like an opiate blocker. It'll help get him off of the heroin. And we did it for, I, I don't even think it was a week. I think he was maybe like three or four days. And he got up, he got up and he came to, uh, he got up one morning and he just said, I, I don't want to even do this. I don't want to do this because I, I'm taking this stuff and all it's making me do is sleep all day long. Um, I don't want to do them. So he literally put him in an envelope, put that envelope in another envelope, and then he mailed it to his girlfriend, hoping that it would help her get her off of whatever. And um, then we sat down on my front porch one afternoon and, and shortly after this whole thing, and we had a kind of father son conversation and and he was he was very upset with me because I hadn't been involved a lot uh, as a normal dad in his life um, and I understood it do you know what I mean I am also a product of divorced parents 
him, my, I was divorced from his mom and, um, you know, so there was that. And then I, I explained to him, he like, so he, he, he gave me a bunch of his anger issues and I, I kind of explained to him, I said, listen, dude, like I have wanted to be a musician since I was like 12, 13 years old, 14 years old. And I said, unfortunately, fortunately, but unfortunately, you were born in July, which is in the height of the touring season. And I was on tour forever with Motley, Rat, like The Scream, every band that I've ever been in, like in July, every summer, you're gone, like you're on tour. So I missed his graduations. I missed his... uh, you know, prom dance. I missed all these milestones in his life, but I had to explain to him. I said, listen, dude, like someday you'll understand what I'm going to say to you right now. And, and, and that is nobody was more upset about missing those days than I was. I've called you And we speak still. I mean, if I go a couple of days without hearing from him or him hearing from me, it's weird. Like we talk almost every day, even if it's just a text. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Like whatever. And we joke with each other. And and it's always been that way. And I said, dude, like I always try to talk with you or call you. Now, I'm going back to a time when I was on tour with the Scream. I would literally get off a tour bus at a truck stop and I'd have to run over to a phone booth with a roll of quarters and call home Remember those or, days. Or, or a calling card. Do you know what I mean? Oh God. I forgot calling cards existed. Yeah. And not now, like you got FaceTime. I can literally be in Europe and I can time and figure out and I can talk to my son or my, my, you know, my granddaughters or whatever. And, you know, so that part of technology is awesome. But I said, I always tried to keep in touch with you. Now I said, you, I want to ask you a question. I said, like, did you like the house that you lived in? Yep. Okay. Well, did you like the school that you went to? Yes. Did you like the clothes that you wore? Yes. And you always had health insurance. You always had you know, mom and me, we had nice cars. Um, you know, I said, how do you think that stuff got paid for? Like it, it required me going on tour to pay for all that stuff that we all had. And he was, he was like, Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I never thought about it. Well, in hindsight, now we move forward and he's got two beautiful, identical twin daughters. And he just, this, uh, about a year ago, he was out on tour with a band called Tantric, playing drums. And he called me on their birthday, their birthday, he was on tour. And he called me to say, I get it. I get it now. I totally get it. And I'm like, okay, that's, you know, whatever. I'm not, uh, this isn't, and I told you so a moment, I knew someday this moment would come and you would understand exactly what I was trying to say to you. It's hard. Doing what I do is not an easy thing. You're gone. I mean, fuck, I, you know, my wife and I were just talking, like I I got married to my wife, Debbie, and, you know, uh, I think it was August of 2014. And I was relatively, you know, I'd write records and I would go out and do weekend gigs and then I would come home. And then all of a sudden I got this gig with this band called the Dead Daisies in February of 2015. So five months later, six months later, I'm in this other band and I was gone like 2015, 16, 17, and 18. 
those four years, I don't think I was home two, two months. So it's hard. <clears throat> you know what I mean? You just, you're, you know, it's, it's a little easier now having FaceTime and Zoom and all these cool little technology things, but it's a little hard, you know, it, and it was hard for him to understand and it made him angry with me and for whatever reasons. And he was angry that mom and dad divorced and, you know, he couldn't, he, <clears throat> he couldn't play drums and be on tour like dad. And, you know, so he just kind of took a little bit of a left turn, but he came back and he's been, he's been great. Like we had this conversation about me not being there. And he said, well, I've always just wanted to be in a band with you. So I said, okay. So I gave him from a drum point of view, um, I gave him the Motley record that I did. And I said, if you can play this from top to bottom, exactly like the record, if you can play this, then the gig is yours. And he wow. said, okay. Now I said, here's the other stipulation though. If you do anything, and, and again, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't feel like I have a, an addictive personality. I have spurts, you know, I'll overeat for a little while because I'm stressed. And then I go, all right, I'm fucking done with this. And then I, I go back to normal. Not good. I know in 10 years from now, when I have a dick growing out of my forehead, you can go, ha, I told you. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, um, he took a little bit of a left turn. We did this thing and then we had this conversation about him, okay, learn the Motley thing. And then I just said to him, I said, listen, I know you smoke weed and drinking, you know, it is what it is bunch of guys on the road everybody wants to have a beer once in a while but <clears throat> I go if you want if you can handle it you can have a beer smoke weed whatever the guys in my band smoke weed as well I go you want to do that that's fine if I see you do anything other than those two things or you start getting out of control you start doing meth coke heroin pills, whatever, you're out. I will send you back to LA to continue being uh, off course. And knock on wood, since I had that conversation with him five or six years ago, he's been fucking stellar. Um, I, I can't, I couldn't be more proud of him. Like I literally. I already I, know him and I'm proud of him. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's the thing, like, he wanted to you can't you have to like, want to you have to have to have to want to and i don't know um too many people even with heroin like I, I know a lot of people that have done heroin and they they've had it was a struggle yeah. to get off of that shit and he just got to a point where he said i want to come live with you and i want to get my life together I think you hit a breaking point. I had that with cocaine. I struggled with cocaine addiction. You hit a breaking point where A, you say, I can't fucking do this anymore for whatever reason. I can't do this anymore, be it for yourself, for your family. But number two, you realize that you have to deal with the underlying issues that are causing you to deal with it in the first place. And you guys, fortunately, were able to have that conversation, you know, and work out why he was feeling all this repressed anger, why he was struggling so much emotionally clearly I think those two things kind of have to be in place if you really want to be successful with going into recovery and staying in recovery yeah and it's and it's and and he did I mean he literally when he when I picked him up at the airport I was like holy shit like and, and you got to understand that you know anybody that knows me that's watching this knows my son he's probably 130 pounds soaking fucking wet to begin with and, and he feels like he's fat um, right now anyway. Um, but he, he was like chalky, 
he had track marks up both arms and he was like pasty. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't doubt if he didn't do a little blast before he got on the plane. Probably he, I did. Well, the last time right before I quit I, was right before I went to California. It was the first thing I did because I hadn't slept. So it's like, okay, let's, let's do some cocaine to get through the, the plane ride and the event that I was, I knew I was going to be sitting at. Let me tell you what a bad idea that was other than the obvious reason. Do you know how shitty it is sitting on a sidewalk for 24 hours coming down off cocaine? You yeah. were saying though that you had some experiences when you were younger that kind of helped you when you were at the height of your fame and everybody around you was doing the drugs that kept you I, wanting I, to be on the straight and narrow. I, I had a few things. Um, the first first one was, God, I, I, I want to say I was maybe 10 or so, 10 years, 11 years old. And now you have to understand like in Philadelphia that we, we had row homes and on the corner of my street on this side, there was a little candy store and it was like, can't, he sold newspapers, candy. Um, there was like an old school ice cream soda fountain counter, like this long counter. And then it, it was like a, an L, you know what I mean? And then he had a pinball machine and a jukebox and a uh, bunch of kids used to hang out there. And now I'm, I'm talking, you know, this, the sixties, Vietnam era, hippies, flower power, peace, love, stop the war, you know? And so there was like some kids that used to hang out on the corner that were a bit, older than me, maybe seven, eight, nine years older, six years, you know, whatever. They were teenagers. I was still not. And there was this one guy, I don't even know his real name. We used to, everybody used to just call him Birdman. Hmm. And cool, coolest looking dude, had long hair, you know, the little goatee and the mustache and wore like a leather fringe vest and hip hugger jeans no shoes i mean it was just total hippie and on occasion he would sit out on the corner and he would with an acoustic guitar and he would play music and all the girls would sit around him and all the dudes and he would play stuff like you know uh credence clearwater revival and the guests he'd play all these all you know, old school classic rock songs, Crosby, Stills and Nash. And, um, and I just remember being completely enamored with this guy. I was like, oh God, he's so cool. You know, I didn't know why, but it had something to do with the guitar. And I was just like, uh. so, um, and my dad hated all of them. Oh, they're drug addicts, they're hippies, you know, whatever. And I was in the store one day and I was playing pinball. So I'm sitting at this pinball machine and over here to my left was the door. And you, so this guy Bird came in one day, he walked in and he came in, he walked behind me and he said, hi to me. He's like, hey, little man, what's up? And I'm like, hey, Bird playing my pinball machine. I'm literally standing on a box because I was always really short. Like, so I'm standing on a box playing this pinball machine. So he walks in behind me and he kind of tucked himself in, in the counter, kind of went this way. So he was in the last seat of the soda fountain, like tucked in this corner. So I'm just sitting there, I'm playing the pinball machine and I turn around in between, like, I the ball, I lost the ball. This it sunk that ball, and I'm just getting ready to shoot the next ball. And I turned around to say something to him, "Hey, bird!" And I, as I turned around, he was literally sitting there tying off with a needle in it, like in his arm. And I, I looked, and I was like, "Oh, that doesn't. I don't know what he's doing." 
but that doesn't look normal. What's normal? Yeah. And I looked again, I shot the ball and then I started playing. I, I didn't even say what I was going to say to him. I just went back to playing pinball, minding my own business. And I'm playing the game and I heard a thud and I turned around and I looked again and like, I, I go like this and he's on the floor and I'm like, what? And then the little old guy that owned the store, this guy named Harry came running at me and he's just yelling, get out, get out, get out of the store. So they kicked me out of the store and he shut the door and he locked it. And then about five minutes later, an ambulance and the police department came. And I just remember them walking out on, with a gurney with the sheet up. And I will never forget that. And I just sat there and I was like, what just happened? Like, I, what just happened here? Like, you know what I mean? And then I, it still didn't dawn on me when they took him away that I would never see him again. Do you know what I mean? And it wasn't until all those girls that used to watch him play guitar, they were all like crying and, oh my God, Birdman died. And, and then I was like, oh. So I always associated this with, death. with that. Well, and I was just like, nope, no. Not, not just so much the needle, but what was in the needle. And it was, you know, heroin. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that at all. What do you wish you would have said to Birdman? You said you stopped yourself. You were going to say something and you stopped yourself. What do you wish you would have said to him? I, you know, honestly, it was probably, I don't even remember what I was going to say to him. I just remember turning around to say something and it could have been about a song that was playing on the jukebox. Do you know what I mean? And it was just, I just, uh, it, you know, and then I saw this and I quick turned around like, that's. You knew it was something you kind of weren't supposed to see. Do you wish you would have said anything to him? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, in hindsight now, yeah, but I didn't know what I was seeing. Of course, of course. So I, there's, you know, I can't sit here and say, well, what if you would have said Birdman? Why oh, no, 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 that's not what I was asking. I was saying as an adult, if you could go back as an adult and say something to him, what would you say? I would say, dude, if you do this, you're going to die. Period. I think that's a fair statement for anybody that's doing hard drugs. It's not an if. That's what I've always said to my friends that get lost and things like that. It's not an if, it's a win. You will die. Yeah, and, you will eventually just, kill yourself. And I've had little, little, little defining moments in my life where I was like, um, so there was the Birdman thing. There was another one where... Um, my son's mother, when I first started hanging out with her, uh, I was in a band with her brother and me and, and my ex-wife and her brother, we would all go up to New York a lot from Philadelphia because New York had all the cool clothing stores and, you know, all the hip shit, the leather. And so we would go up there and we'd hang out for the day. We could buy stuff and then come home and uh, apply it to our band or whatever but her she had an uncle up there who was a stained glass guy he would he he made stained glass and he had a partner in this business and um we had hung out with them a bunch like just sit around you know have some wine stay overnight leave the next day go back to philly and um you know cool guys and i remember getting a phone call from the, her uncle's name was Donnie. And we got a phone call from uncle Donnie. And he said that his partner had passed away the night before. And we were like, what the fuck? Like what happened? You know, cause they were young. I mean, Donnie wasn't, you know, I'm 62. Donnie was probably wasn't even 70. Like in now, like he wasn't that much older than us. 
And again, um, apparently the partner, they, there was a deadline. They, they needed to get some of these windows done and they were behind schedule and the partner went out and bought some Coke and he was doing the window stuff and he was, you know, working and he would take a little break and he'd run into the bathroom and, you know, come back out. And he was just, you know, pop, 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 pop. And, he, and apparently he bought some Coke and he went into the bathroom and he, you know, after doing this four or five times and no sleep or whatever, he literally went into the bathroom, did a line and his heart exploded and he dropped dead. And I was like, so that was another thing. I went cocaine, not good. I'm not going to do this. Um, and, and, and then my third and final one was I was in a band that was playing in a lot of the clubs in and around New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I remember we were getting ready to go to a gig and I was riding with my bass player and we went to this guy's house who sold meth. And my bass player was very, very angry because the guy was out. He didn't have any meth. And he was like, I got a show to do. And, and he's freaking out. Like, I've got a fucking show to do. And I can't get through the night. I need, I need some meth. Like, and he was freaking. And I'm standing there like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, like is this happening right now? You're saying that you cannot play this show unless you have meth. That's heartbreaking. Now, the, the crazy part was the dealer said, oh, I don't really have any meth. But he, he went into his wallet and he had these little plastic bags, right, that the dealer used to do meth as well. So he had all these plastic bags, like 10 of them, and he gave them to the bass player. The bass player went over to the stove, turned on a teapot, boiled some water, poured it into a coffee cup, put the bags in, stirred the water for about a minute, and just drank the water to get the residue out of the meth. And he goes, okay, that'll help. And, he, and then we went and we did the gig. And I just sat there and I went, oh my God, like... I like, I can't wait to get on stage. I'm so jacked to get on stage. Like, I cannot believe I'm looking at an individual that cannot function without the drugs, without this. So I just said, heroin out, Coke out, meth out. I don't ever want to be in. And so even at parties, like with, motley and you know being on tour with the scream and traveling all over promoters all the time used to go hey man i can get you guys some coke if you want it and even in the scream like i remember the guy sitting in the back lounge of the bus you know the promoter would give him a bag of coke and they would sit in the back lounge and have some drinks and then do some coke and I would just be like, fuck this. I'm going to bed. I need to sleep. So I would go to sleep and I could hear them in the back, back, back. They do like a bunch of Coke and then sit down there and, and then like start solving all the problems of the world. Rainforests are being cut down at, you know, a thousand acres a day. Sperm whales are almost extinct. How do we, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, what a bunch of fucking idiots. Idiots. Done. I don't think you're helping the rainforest or the, the spring whales. I, I, yeah. You know, it, it was just, I, I just, I just, those three things, I just looked at them very young. Like, I, I mean, even the thing with the tea and the, the bags. It's disturbing that the 
I was maybe and 19. fall so far down that they need it that badly. I've watched people do some pretty yes. crazy stuff for drugs. Yeah. And, and I just sat there and I went, I was 19. And it just stuck with me forever. And it was like, uh, and I think I'm a movie guy. Requiem for a Dream. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I couldn't watch it either. I got about halfway through it and went, what? Yeah. Oh, my God, right now. Yeah, like the the abscess in his arm. Yeah. And then and then at the end, her doing the thing for money. And I'm like. I didn't get to the end. I did not get that far. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, I know people that have been that bad. And it's just like. Uh, I, I I just found it disturbing when I was young and it just stuck with me. So I would go to parties, even with the Motley guys or the scream or whatever. And people go, Hey man, you want some Coke? And I'm like, Nope, I'm good. Never did it. Never will. That and one, that one kind of hit me the most because I remember when I was at my worst and I will say I never got higher on my son or anything, but I was angry. I was angry at my partner at the time. We got in a big fight I said, I need this. I need something to get me through. I don't know what to do. I was freaking out. So I said, okay, I'm just going to do a little bit. And then that didn't do anything. So I'm just going to do a little bit more, just a little bit. Right. Next thing I know, I look down, the bag's empty. I'm going, oh shit. And it hit me all at once. Next thing I know, I'm overdosed on a bathroom floor. I could have been your friend. I could have just as easily had my heart explode or you know, had a stroke or something. I could have just as easily... Yes. than that person because I said just a little bit that's what addicts do just a little bit oh, it's not going to affect me I'm not going to be that person you can be that person you I mean, absolutely it, can look be at that. um he's I mean he's a friend of mine um I think he's an incredibly sweet human being and he's had a, he's had a rough life you know but look at even Steven Adler um great dude how the fuck do you get thrown out of Guns N' Roses for doing too much drugs? <laughs> I, I mean, think about that. I'm not that. laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because that's... Yeah, yeah but it's, crazy. you know, and I, I think I said to you the other day when we were talking about doing this interview, you know, most people, again, there's this, it, it, it's everything kind of interlocks with each other. You know, you got your social media, you got this, you got that, you got consequences, you got all this other shit. But I think most people, most people are oblivious to the fact, like they look down on other people for, for things, or they're, they're looking at that guy when they should be focusing on themselves. They're, they're paying attention to that guy's issue or that guy's gripes or that guy's whatever, and how his gripes are going to affect them. And most people don't realize and I said it the other day, but you are one mistake from being the homeless guy or being Birdman or being Steven Adler or being, you're just one mistake. Nobody's immune. Nobody's immune from addiction. Nobody's immune from homelessness. Nobody's immune from any of this. It can affect yeah. absolutely anybody. And guys, if you are struggling with addiction, whether it's from social media or drugs, if you're struggling with anxiety, depression, any of that right now, I'm going to give a lot of resources down below. There is help. People do care. I care. I very much do. If you need someone to talk to, please feel free to reach out to either to me personally or even to John or to one of these organizations take that first step. That's what it takes. Just taking that first step because you're not immune. People do care. There is help. John, is there any last bit of advice that you would give to someone that might be struggling with any of these things, be it anxiety, depression, mental health, social media, the news, addiction? You know, honestly, um, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, um, I'm all about helping people that want help. You know what I mean? It, my son included, I, you know, and, 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 it, and it's, maybe it's crass, maybe it's crude, maybe it's bad parenting. But I, I said to him when he wanted to come out here, um, before he even came out and we had our talk, I basically felt the need. And I don't know if this is right or wrong. I'm not a, 
therapist. I'm not a, I'm not even a person that's gone through any of the, these issues, but I just felt like I had to say to him, if you're coming to Nashville to continue to do what you're doing now, then just stay where you're at. Cause I'm not going to sit here and watch you Die. do what you're doing. Um, and so I really, you know, I know that people need help. I know that um, my wife and I were just talking about this yesterday. Um, I know that people need help. Um, but people, they're not going to listen to someone like me tell them to help themselves until they're ready to help themselves. You know, so, you know, all I can say to somebody is look in the mirror and truly from your heart, ask yourself if you're the best person you can be. I think that's excellent advice. And for the record, from one parent to another, I very much think you did the right thing. I would do the exact same thing for my son because your son clearly wanted to take that first step. He wanted to get help. He wasn't just saying, dad, fix all my problems. He was saying, hey, I, I fucked up. I need your help. I think I that you help. are a great parent. Yeah. I, I need your help. I want to come and live with you and get my life together. I'm willing to do the work is what he was saying. I'm willing to do the work. I just need you by my side. And, and But again, that all boils back to where we were in the very beginning of this conversation about spirituality and all that stuff. And it's just about simple law of nature. Get up, have a shower, put some fresh clothes on, brush your teeth and be prepared. Have a goal whatever that goal is. Even if it's small. Yeah. Do baby steps. But, you know, like I get up and I say, well, here's, you know, I have, my goals are a little bigger than the next guy, but I just sit there and I go, okay, in the next four or five years, this is what I want. I want this. And this is how I, this, I, I'm a little nervous right now because of everything that's going on and I haven't worked for a while, but I'm trying to divert that energy into a record and a book and other things. But like, have a goal, but work hard. I mean, even, even for a better appearance, it takes time. It takes work. It takes getting up and washing your face and putting some sort of moisturizing lotion on and then sitting down and doing a hundred sit-ups a day or walking a mile or two or just moving. Do you know what I mean? It, it takes work. You got to motivate yourself to do it, but just ask yourself, am I the best person that I can be? Am I being good to myself first? And then I'm, am I being good to everybody in my circle? You know, and it's, you know, fuck the Facebook likes fight, you know, all that other shit. That was another thing, not to get off on a tangent, that I did learn very early on when I was actually getting out of Motley. Um, I, there was the rumors that Vince might be coming back, was wearing on me. And then my mom had passed away from cancer at 57 years of age. My son was diagnosed with diabetes and then Motley let me go. And then the girl that I was living with decided that she needed a little space and she needed to focus on her career shortly after all of this other shit happened. And I kind of sat down and I was just dwelling on the fact that my phone wasn't ringing. I wasn't getting calls to the parties anymore. And I wasn't I wasn't able to take the limo to the, you know, Tesla concert and, you know, uh, like I was focusing on all of these things that I was losing. My ex-wife invited me up to her house for Christmas dinner. And at this point we had been separated a while. She was dating someone else and I went up for, for dinner and, you know, 
Now, I got these weird little signs. Um, I had no money. I was fucking broke. And I had this, you know, those giant, they're like literally like a three gallon or four gallon pickle jar. Yes. Yes. I'm, do they still make those? I remember. I don't even know, but it was this giant jar that I had. And all the time that I was in Motley, I would come home every night and I would get undressed. I'd reach into my pocket. I would take my money out. If I had any ones or change, I would just throw it in the pickle jar and I would go to sleep. And I did this for the whole, I was in Motley for like five years and I did this. And um, so now I'm freaking out. Like it's Christmas. I don't have any money. I'm a fucking loser. I'm out of the band. My chick left me. My mom died. My kids got diabetes. I don't you know, I, I was just miserable. And, and then it was funny, like, I, I literally just looked at the pickle jar and I went, ah, you know what, I'll just take this to one of those supermarket coin counting thing. I'll take the, the bills out. I'll do the coin counting thing. You know, I can probably throw my kids 20 bucks each for Christmas, whatever. And I literally, it, I literally was took the cat, you know, the paper out and I start pouring this thing in and I'm watching the counter and it's going like 50 bucks, hundred bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, dump more, 500 bucks, 600 bucks. And I literally had in change, I had about $300 in paper money but there was like in total i had like i had like twenty one hundred dollars oh god in this here job. i think i'm doing good if i find five bucks and change around the house. no but it, it, but this is one of those things where you know like i was i always tell my friends i said you know like i have to remain positive for some reason in my life every time i would get down to like my last 10 bucks i'd be like fuck Somehow the universe always provides. Provides. Yep. So I do this thing with the pickle jar and I dump all this money in. And, and so I'm sitting there dumbfounded. I'm like, holy shit, I've got like two fucking grand. This is awesome. Took the money, put it into my bank. I went and I bought my kid some toys. I bought my daughter some stuff. And then I bought my ex-wife. I knew I was going for dinner. I, I got her a bottle of red wine. I know she likes red wine. So I got her some red wine. She made this awesome dinner. And then she said, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna go. You know, I've, I knew she had a boyfriend. She's like, I'm going to go. I got a gift for my guy. And so she's like, I'm going to, can you hang out with the kids for a little bit? So I, yeah, sure. No worries. So she splits. I'm hanging out with my son. My daughter was like, you know, a little bit of a teenager. So she was off in her room on her phone or computer or whatever. She's doing her thing. So I'm laying on this couch and I took a pillow and I propped it between my legs and I put some sort of fucking Disney movie on and I'm just laying there. And um, my kid at this point now was maybe 12, 13 years old, whatever, maybe a little younger. And he's just laying there and he goes, um, no, no, let me think about this now. He was 10 because it was 97. Um, so we're laying there, we're watching a movie and um, he just, he just, you know, during the movie casually, he just goes, hey dad. And I'm like, what's up buddy? So he goes, Thank you for coming and hanging out with us on Christmas. And I'm like, ah, yeah, no worries, buddy. I wanted to see you. You know what I mean? A little pause. And then he goes, I love you. And I swear to God, I went, what the fuck am I thinking? What am I freaking out about? This is, this is it right here.
this is it. All of these people, this is family. This is friends. These are, That's even life. my ex-wife, yeah, to this day, my ex-wife now moved to Nashville and she's like one of my best friends. She's a sweetheart. And she comes here and hangs out with me and my wife. And she's actually stayed at my house. She came to visit my son and stayed with us for the weekend. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so, but I just sat there and it really put everything into perspective for me. It's not about how many likes you have on Facebook. It's about just that certain amount, a handful of really good people in your life that'll say, hey, Amanda, you know what? You're being a fuck up right now. They're honest with Knock you. Knock that shit off. <laughs> Knock that shit off. Come down to earth. Be human. Stop it. There's consequences here. Do you know what I mean? And it really kind of put a lot of things into perspective. And that's why now, like, I, again, I hate to keep saying it, but I was talking to my wife the other day. I said, you know, it's, it's funny. I don't understand... People get so emotional about things that people say online. I said, I have lived my whole life since 1992, most of my or adult life or a big portion of it has been total strangers, people that I don't know saying, fuck you, Vince Neil's better. You're a fucking loser. Fuck you you don't deserve to be in Motley Crue or, you know, they just go on and on and on. They still do it to this day. I wonder why. It, it doesn't matter. Like it's to me, I'm not going to waste one brain cell worrying about why that person thinks that I'm a loser. I can't, I can't. And I did for a while. And then when I had that epiphany with my kid, I just kind of went, you know what? Just do what you do, man. Just stop worrying about it. Stop, you know, and I've had, a, I just had a few things in my life where somebody psh, psh, smacked me, whether it was my dad, my son, whatever, and said, stop it, stop boohooing. And you know, you're looking at the glass the wrong way. It's not half empty. It's half full. I know it's a stupid adage that everybody, whatever, but there's some truth to that. You know, you have to, you know, you have to stop looking at all of the shit things that are gone wrong in your life, because guess what? They're happening to everybody. Shift your focus. Shift right. Your focus. Refocus and look at the positives that are going on what you do have and you know and I know some people need a little shove you know but you can shove them all day long and until they realize what I've realized you know 20 years ago 25 years ago it they're not you know so I try not to tell people what to do um if they want my if they want my opinion I'll give it I, I don't say anything. Um, you know, one of the other things, and I, I apologize to anybody out there that does this, but I find I have a few friends that are what they, what do they call them? Life coaches. Yes. And I was like, wait, you're a life coach. You're a fucking train wreck. Yes. Are you fucking kidding me right now? I actually do life coaching. I'm actually a certified life coach. And some of the other coaches I see, I go, wait a, wait a second. You're coaching people on how to get their life together when your life isn't together. <laughs> That's yeah, like I taking mean, advice, health advice from a doctor that smokes and I, cigarettes I'm, and is overweight. I, I mean that in no disrespect. but I 100% agree with you. There, there's, there's, I, I don't. You know, I think a lot of them look at it from a business point of view. Like, yeah. oh, I can make money off these people. Yep. And I, I can see it every day. They'll pay me to sit and talk to them for an hour. Yep. And I just sit there and I go, wow. Like, mm, that's crazy. And I, I, I also, I, I, it, it was funny. Like, again, and this is just me. This is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. 
which is zero. This next statement and the last one and the one before that, you can't even buy a donut with what I'm giving you right now. So, um, but it was funny. Like I remember having a talk with my ex-wife and she was like, literally, you know, this self-help book and that self-help book and that self-help book and that self-help book and this one, and this one's a New York times bestseller. And it, and I just sit there and I go, you do realize that that you're paying that person's mortgage. Whoever wrote that book, you're paying their mortgage. I mean, it's all great. What's the secret? I don't know. The secret is just sit down and figure it out. Like, again, I'm not against therapy. I'm not against the books and, and this. The, it has the, to be a part of your healing process. It can't be your healing process. You're not going to buy a book that's going to fix your life and fix all your problems. Exactly. And you're going to marry a supermodel and be rich. That's, that's not how that works. It can be part of it, but it's not going to actually do it but for what you. It boils down to is my initial statement 45 minutes ago, which by the way, you're never getting back. Um, is you've got to well want to help yourself. You've got to want to help yourself. Okay, maybe buying a book is a step in the right direction, but what's in the book is not going to help you until you decide that you want to be a better person. And then when you do that, I feel like you'll pretty much figure it out on your own. When I was in my darkest spot, I remember actually being on a ledge in Canada back in 2018. I was on the ledge ready to jump in in my life. I was done. I felt like I tried everything. I'd read self-help books till my eyes felt like bleeding. I you know, went to the therapy, taken the medication, done in my mind everything that I could except actually take responsibility, take that power, say, you know, I'm actually not making decisions that are good for optimal mental health. I'm not living a lifestyle that's conducive to optimal mental health. And I can read every Wayne Dyer book under the sun, rest in peace, blessed his soul, but it's not going to help you if you're not ready to do the work, if you're not willing to do the work. It can give you tips, it can motivate you, but it can't do it for you. Right, and 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 that's the thing, like it, it all boils down. When you said to me, what would you say to somebody in, in need and I would just say just seriously look in the mirror and ask the other person in the mirror what can I do to be the best me possible you know a person that is and I, I again I apologize I'm throwing out all of the political disclaimers here but you can't tell me that a person that is maybe overweight that stands in front of a mirror and looks at themselves says, I look good. No, they don't. They beat themselves up about it because they know they don't look good. So, or they, you know what I mean? That's a touchy statement. Actually, you know no, I just, I just had an interview with uh, Jennifer Jimenez, who is an actress and she struggled a lot with body image and uh, she went from drugs to uh, eating disorders to then gaining a lot of weight. So she went from one end of the spectrum to the other where she lost a bunch of weight and then gained a bunch of weight. She's an actress and a model. And she's talking about that. She said, there was a point where I just looked in the mirror and hated myself. And I want actually every single person that's watching this right now, I want you to take that advice, pause this video if you need to go look in the mirror and just stand there for a couple minutes, look at yourself, be honest with all the feelings that come up. Don't judge them. Just let everything come up, feel it. And then come back here and tell us in the comments, if it's somebody that you're happy with who you are right now, are you happy with that person? If not, what's the next step you're going to take? What is the first step you are going to take to move forward? Yeah. I mean, it could be even something simple, like, you know, um, just getting out and, taking a walk around the neighborhood um you know it just you know you you can see people aren't stupid i really believe like people aren't stupid they get they get caught up in maybe that image on on a, a lore magazine or whatever oh i'm never gonna look like that you don't have to look like that you know just be the best you you can be, be that healthy. person doesn't look like that either they're i know just let you know <laughs> I, I i dated one and it was like 
wait. I shot for Playboy and I remember looking at my pictures and they were gorgeous, but I'm sitting there going, I don't wake up looking like that every morning. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's weird. I know, like, I, I and I even have my moments, you know, I, and it's and it's funny for me, like, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to focus. I'm going to write a book. So I wrote a book. But the whole time I was doing it, I'm sitting there with a cup of tea or coffee or, you know, I do my water with a little miho in it and, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm typing and I'm sending stuff off to the other guy that was helping me write. So I'm doing this and making changes and I'm reading and then I go to the thing and I get a bag of Cheetos and I'm eating the Cheetos while I'm doing it. And I'm, you know, and then I, it was funny, like I, I got up. And I went into, I took a shower and then I tried to put a pair of jeans on that I hadn't put on in a while. And I'm like, cheated waist. <laughs> yeah, I look at my, I look at myself in the mirror and then I got on the scale and I went, holy shit. I'm the heaviest I've ever been in my life. And I fucking hated my, and I, I kind of, I kind of got stuck for a little bit. And then I went, you know, I'm not buying into these, you know, I looked up a couple things. Here's social media, looked up a couple things online. And then all of a sudden I started getting ads for it. You don't even have to work out. Just take this bill. You'll lose 30 pounds while you sleep. And I'm like, that's bullshit, bullshit. I'm just going to do it the old fashioned way. I went on my thing and I did a calorie counter and I said, here's how much I want to weigh. Here's how much I weigh now. And boom. And it gave me a calorie intake. I, I literally eat something and I take a photo of the barcode or I do it and I just portion my meals and I'm just being a little more active than I was during the beginning of COVID. And I've literally lost 20 pounds. And it, it's, I, it took me looking at myself in the mirror and saying, no, this isn't, this isn't you. This isn't, stop, you know? Um, so, I, I, but I, you have to want to do it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where people don't know where to get started. They know what they need to do. They just don't know where to get started. Or there's, or there's like three things. And I always tell my son the same thing. He gets so angry because he's like, oh, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. And I go, you know what you're going to accomplish? He goes, what? I go, nothing because you're focused on all four. Do one, figure that out, move it to the side, tackle the next thing, figure, figure it out, move it to the side. One at a time. You can't do them all. One thing at a time. That's why I said now, like we were talking about this thing. So I quit smoking. I gained some weight. I gained weight. So now everybody's on me about this. And I said, I will get rid of this when I get back down to the weight that I want to be on. You can't tackle two addictions at the same time, smoking and eating. It's got to be one at a time. Get to where you want to be. Then when I'm at my weight, then I will watch what I eat and get rid of that. Done. Absolutely. Categorizing or what's the uh, carp? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Compartmentalizing. Oh, compartmentalizing, yes. Thank you. Yep. I had a brain fart there. I'm old. I have them all the time. I like to believe I'm not old, but definitely starting to feel it a little bit. John, yeah. thank you so much for coming and sharing all of your experiences with us here. I don't know if it was helpful or not, but I appreciate the- uh, I think there was a lot of value. You. I don't know how long we've been talking, but this is time that you're never getting back. Anybody else that's been watching this, I apologize. You're never getting this time back. And Tell him it was well spent, guys. Tell him it was a well spent. <laughs> thank you very I much. I disagree. I think that there was a lot of value. <laughs> I think that we're gonna see that. I think that people are gonna let us know. Like I said, guys, Go look in the mirror and let us know what you see. Let us know if you love that person, if you love that person but need to make a few changes, make sure that you subscribe so we can keep this conversation about mental health going so we can keep being open, sharing our stories with each other because that's how we're going to break the stigma. Thank you guys so, so much.